Terra has been under siege before, right? That would have ended badly for everyone involved. But then it happened again and again. But in the newest lore, how would this look? And would it actually work this time? In the most up-to-date 40k lore, the lion seems to be confined to Imperium Nihilus, whilst Rebute Gilliman has ordered Call create him a vast new army of Primaris, so he too can venture into the depths of Nihilus. Imperium Sanctus borders continue to shrink, assailed constantly by the Dark Pantheon's followers, spilling forth from Nihilus as well as from the Great Rift itself. With half the galaxy blind to the Emperor's guiding light, and its citizens progressively becoming more critical of the Imperial Creed, were the War Master of Chaos to assemble his forces for one final push on Terra right now? Would mankind even stand a chance? Let's analyse now what is likely to occur, should Abaddon muster sufficient forces to make a push on Terra itself. In this first part, we'll now detail the resistance, devout as it is deadly, that any intruder would face should they wish to commit an act of aggression towards Segmentum Solar, home to Terra itself. Make sure you keep an eye out for our next upload, where we not only discuss the forces Abaddon would require to breach these defences, but also announce the lucky recipient of the model giveaway from our last video. There's a fair bit to pick through here guys, and I'm interested in hearing your opinions on this, so make sure you follow along and comment below. YouTube tells me almost 86% of our viewers aren't subscribed, so please, if you do enjoy the content, do make the effort to sub as it really helps our reach on YouTube. Firstly, we know Abaddon believes the Imperium itself should have been inherited by the same warriors who bled to forge it, that is, the Astartes legions of old, in his quest for revenge against an empire that he believes would have cast them aside once the galaxy was won, Ezekiel Abaddon in his ambition, has even gone so far as to become the greatest champion of the Dark Pantheon, ensuring that he personally, as well as the military resources at his disposal, are deadly and capable as possible, vowing to personally kick down the doors to the Emperor's Sanctum and skewer the Emperor of Mankind with his talon. In 10,000 years, Abaddon's determination has only increased. The War Master of Chaos will stop at nothing to achieve his ultimate aim in ruling his own galaxy-spanning empire. And you can be sure that a spoiler is acutely aware of the challenge laid out before him. The seemingly insurmountable forces his legions of traitor Astartes, corrupted cultists, and diabolical demons need to overcome in order to reach the throne world. Now there are various means of approach to Terra and we'll dive into these in more detail in our part 2 video due out in a few days. But as any avid 40k lore enthusiast knows, entry from warp via the system's mandible point is but one means of egress. This is important to note because an enemy's means of effecting arrival within Sol very much correlates with the defences which could be mustered to combat it. For instance, Horus's two-pronged attack during the Heresy by both conventional as well as etheric means put the Loyalist defenders on the back foot, forcing them to consider what else they do not know in a warp-influenced theatre of war. Similar techniques could be used within the most up-to-date lore of 40k, with fleets guided by sorcery penetrating Sol's territory, bypassing its outer defences, but that doesn't mean there are not more conventional means, such as approach from outer system, an extremely timely if not unwise manner of approach, but also warp translation emerging into the material realm from the warp at the outer edges of Segmentum Solar, close to the mandible point. For the purpose of these videos, we'll discuss a more general approach, dropping out of the warp via mandible point, the strength likely required as well as the defences which can be mustered. Were we to begin diving into particular means of effecting entry, we could do an entire video on that, and even then, it's going to be maybes and theoreticals at best. To even begin to do justice in detailing the defences of the most well-defended territory within the entire material galaxy, you must first understand that being the centre of humanity's power, home to the throne of Terra itself, from one end of Segmentum Solar to the other, patrol fleets the size of other Segmentum's main battle fleets. Moons and other planetoids bristle with enough orbital defences to waylay, if not entirely eliminate, any but the most determined, numerous attacker, whilst elite troops whose millennia of life has been spent training for the exact moment of impending attack are poised to strike. 
Hundreds of star forts stand vigil in the cold of the void, crewed by devout, merciless servants of the throne, whilst billions upon billions of guns point out from star fort and atmospheric defence platform alike to watch the approach to terror. A host of uncountable, wide-eyed pilgrims float through the void in fleet stage lines further than the eye can see, whilst black hole security craft constantly prowl the masses, intent on sniffing out any who are not what they seem. Now from the very outset, any who dare to trespass within the Imperium's most ancient of territories, even its outer borders, will doubtless be discovered by the many floating auger relays or otherwise vigilant patrols of Battlefleet Solar. Within this early stage of contact, already vast resources are automatically mustering to counter this trespasser. Specially adjusted predatory void servitors within the vicinity of such a contact would immediately follow seek and destroy hunter programming whilst the many relay stations scattered throughout Seoul disperse a threat broadcast to a wide array of listening outposts. The perceived nature of this threat being escalated to nearby fleet or outpost assets depending upon the proximity of either. As you would likely expect for an area of space so critical to the spiritual well-being of the Imperium, let alone its function and administration, Seoul boasts the most numerous as well as most powerful fleet-based assets within the entire Imperium. Not only does the Solar Fleet contain the highest quantity of larger battleship variants within its number compared to any other Imperial fleet on record, but specialist craft such as the legendary, ancient phalanx of the Imperial Fists and sleeker, more secretive craft belonging to the Inquisition and Grey Knights also are available to aid depending on the threat posed. To waylay and hinder intruders, unimaginably vast areas of space are home to an immense quantity of void mines. These not only exist as a means of destroying or hindering enemy void assets, but also to cut off particular trajectories which enemy vessels could use to reach key Imperial assets quicker, forcing them to avoid these zones entirely, either buying Imperial Defence Forces time or guiding enemy ships into the teeth of waiting Imperial craft or otherwise weapons platforms. All the while, any changes in enemy composition, dispersion and contact are being relayed throughout Seoul's many listening stations to project a broader strategic picture for Imperial Command. And so you can see that fleet assets are deadly efficient within Seoul itself, utilising their powerful artillery as well as pre-laid defences to deter, guide and eliminate enemy fleets. Of course if the forces of the Pantheon are known for one thing, it's the rate of recruitment their many followers can conjure, and this is especially true of the Despoiler. So we'll discuss how his fleet compares to that of the Imperiums and how he may attempt to circumnavigate these defences in part 2. Of course there are many planets within Segmentum Solar which in themselves pose a significant threat to intruders. The Throne World is not the only planet which can muster powerful defenders. Were one's plan to not only pierce the defences of Segmentum Solar but to arrive at Terra itself, the ongoing constant attrition one's fleet would sustain are immense. For not only do planets and moons such as Mars, Saturn, Titan and Luna possess an unholy amount of troops and void ordnance, some of the most elite warriors within the entire galaxy maintain a constant vigil over this area of space. Some of these are the Solar Watch, Grey Knights, Sisters of Silence and the Imperial Fist Chapter's own flagship, the Phalanx. Charged by the most sacred of Imperial authorities to ensure not a single outward threat is able to prevail in its journey to reach the Throne World, the Solar Watch, a storied shield host of the Adeptus Custodes, patrol every world, moon, and even void structure within Sol. They maintain a presence everywhere, even when these elite white and golden demigods are not physically in the vicinity. Able to deploy at less than a moment's notice, as only the handcrafted bodyguards of the Emperor are capable of, their sole purpose is to ensure the Emperor's most holy of realms remains free of the taint of the mutant, the heretic, and the xenos. Were any force to compose a significant threat to Segmentum Solar, it is not even then guaranteed that the most secretive of Astartes' brotherhoods, the Grey Knights, would intervene. 
However, were the forces of the Despoiler to become involved, as per their sacred remit, the Grey Knights chapter would almost beyond a doubt deploy substantial forces to combat this chaos threat. Their numbers have dwindled considerably in recent years though, with the Brotherhoods no longer able to respond to even the greatest threats posed by the Pantheon. Even prior to the formation of the Great Rift, it was commonplace for the most spiritually pure of their order to undertake perilous missions such as preventing the birth or even banishing a greater demon, which, benign to all, would likely result in the Astartes' death, just to conserve the chapter's strength for more larger conflicts, lest multiple brothers meet their end. Since the Cicatrix Maledictum has formed, and subsequently bred demonic infestation the likes of which the galaxy has never seen, the Grey Knight's numbers are at an all-time low, whilst pleas for aid are a constant stream from every corner of the galaxy, the Grey Knight's prognosticars working tirelessly to filter the more malevolent demonic manifestations for deployment of their forces. Now, under such pressure, it is doubtless the Grey Knights would still respond to an intersegmentum threat posed by Chaos. Though, whether their sacred brotherhoods had the strength on hand at the time to make their presence felt to their arch enemy is another matter entirely. Alongside these transhuman specialists, the Convent Prioris of the Sisters of the Ebon Chalice is capable of mustering a great many warriors of faith, while storied Astra Militarum regiments such as the Lucifer Blacks stand ready to respond to any taint as their forebears did some ten millennia prior. But there are even more specialised ranks whose headquarters reside within Sol, those being the potent Sisters of Silence and the deadly efficient agents of the Officio Assassinorum. Whilst the Silent Sisterhood would surely boost the effectiveness of warp fighting talents among any throng of humanity mustered to defend against a chaos invasion, the ever present threat of Assassinorum agents capable of infiltrating the ranks of the Great Enemy would prove a constant hindrance to any chaos forces. For every target within the ranks of chaos worshippers who held a senior position within Abaddon's greater strategy, doubtless several Assassinorum agents would be dispatched. This is to say nothing of kill orders in place against the Despoiler and his infamous chosen inner circle whose lives have already been in peril at the hands of Assassinorum agents multiple times before. It seems the skill set as well as military might arrayed in a concentrated area against the Despoiler's followers may stop his forces in their tracks before they've made any semblance of egress into Seoul. But this is to say nothing of the untold thousands of astropathic messages which will be dispatched to all loyalist formations capable of hearing, from not only Segmentum Solar, but any loyalist forces capable of sparing resources in this age of darkness from Tempestus or even Tyranid-infested Pacificus, no doubt would send whatever troops they had available to repel the threat of chaos to the throne world and the Emperor himself. This includes the Salamanders chapter whose home world of Nocturne lies within Sol's neighbouring Segmentum of Tempestus, but also the guard worlds of Talan and Katachan, or the resource-rich world of Baylor, which, in itself, housed an Imperial Guard garrison of 250 million souls prior to the formation of the Rift. Rin's world, home of the Crimson Fists including their recent Primaris reinforcements, and the vaunted deathly troopers of Krieg, whose homeworld lays to the west of Terra in Segmentum Pacificus. All these and more would not for a moment bulk at the concept of contributing what resources they wield to the throne world's defence. For all know, should the Emperor himself be slain, unimaginable as that is to most, the reality is mankind as a species would soon follow. And finally, in an era where the 40k narrative is forging new progressive law at a greater rate than we've ever seen, do you believe the Emperor of Mankind himself may intervene at a critical moment. We'll discuss this point further in our next video, so make sure you're keeping an eye out and checking the channel for uploads. Make sure you join us in our next videos where we'll not only discuss the forces which will be required to be mustered to overcome Soul's defences, but we'll introduce wildcard elements into the mix. Some may be loyal to the throne, yet others to neither side of the conflict. We'll also detail how an invasion may play out, something which is sure to interest anybody who has been following the Siege of Terror novels. 
Make sure you tune in for that, as well as to hear whether you have won the Primaris Space Marine with Jump Pack in our first ever giveaway on Titan Wargaming. Likewise, you can hop on over to our community Discord and chat hobby and lore with us. It's starting to build in numbers and honestly has some really great people in it. You don't have to be paying a membership to join the Discord, I'd love to just build a worldwide tight-knit community of lore enthusiasts and hobbyists, so come on over and say hi. Supporting us on Patreon nets you free stuff and helps us to create more content with better gear and editing programs. There's even three tiers of support available, beginning from as low as $2, with the highest tier including high-res artwork for a fraction of the price you would pay anywhere else. If you'd like to show your support, just follow the link in the description to see what's available. If you're looking to purchase Warhammer models, then doing so through our link to Gap Games is another excellent way to support us. And of course, if you're enjoying our content, please consider hitting the like, notification and subscribe buttons. This is a really excellent free way to support the channel and tells YouTube's algorithm to share our videos with more people. Thanks so much for watching, I really do appreciate your support. Until next time, take it easy and have a good one.